Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, is Wall Street taking over ownership of nature? Our guest, Randall Ray, is a professor of economics at Bard College. His current research focuses on providing a critique of orthodox monetary theory and policy and the development of an alternative approach. He also publishes extensively in the areas of full employment policy and more generally fiscal policy. Ray's most recent book is A Great Leap Forward, Heterodox Economic Policy for the 21st Century. Randall Ray, welcome to Talk World Radio. Hi, thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on. So there was a recent headline that said Wall Street was creating new products to take ownership of nature of ecosystems, but this is part of a long-standing trend and practice, isn't it? Well, sure. Uh, they already financialized commodities, uh, food, housing, education, healthcare in the form of insurance. Um, I mean, even life itself, peasant insurance, insuring against the death of your uh, workers. Um, it goes on and on. And of course, in the very beginning, uh, it was financialization of slave bodies. That's where mortgages came from. The original mortgages were on bodies, not on homes. So our homes are also uh, thoroughly financialized. And then with CDOs, squared, cubed, uh, there are many, many bets placed against us. And, and so what's the what's the traditional theory of this that needs critiquing and, and what's the alternative approach? Well, I think um, that uh, the idea that we should just um, deregulate and move to self-supervision, which is what we did for the big biggest banks. Um, you're too big and too complicated for the government to supervise you and regulate you. So why don't you supervise yourselves? And we saw how that turned out in the global financial crisis. We will see again. It's going to turn out the same way. And, and that, that's, the, that's the traditional theory is that you should deregulate big, big corporations and big financial institutions? Well, for the past uh, 40 to 50 years, yes. When the, the last time our economy was really heavily financialized was in the lead up to the Great Depression. Uh, that crashed. And uh, as you know, when FDR came in, uh, Roosevelt uh, came in, in the first 100 days, he had a, a, a broad-based package uh, to deal with the Great Depression, and that included um, essentially uh, downsizing the financial system, putting it back in its proper place, which is financing real activities, uh, you know, not financing, uh, financializing our food supply. Um, and um, we heavily regulated the banking system. But gradually over time, uh, we reduced the regulations and supervision. Uh, finance played a very small role in the economy when we came out of World War II. And gradually, it went back to doing what it was doing in the 1920s. What, when you say the proper role is limited to financing real activities, which activities are, are the real ones? Well, we really would like our uh, banks to focus on financing productive activities. Uh, you know, that, that was the role of commercial banks in the beginning and investment banks. So uh, firms need finance to start the production process. Firms need finance to invest in capital equipment. Those are legitimate activities for the financial system. Um, we could argue about whether uh, the FDR approach to uh, home finance was the best of all possible worlds, but it definitely worked very, very well for a very long time. People virtually never lost their homes. And the financing of the homes was largely done by savings and loans, Jimmy Stewart's thrifts, and those virtually never failed either. Um, but uh, slowly over time, we deregulated and um, in two ways, we allowed non-banks 
what we now call the shadow banks. To get involved in these activities and compete with the regulated banks, and then the regulated bank said, hey, this isn't fair. So we said, well, okay, we're going to deregulate you. So, I mean, there was always this uh, seesaw back and forth um, that gradually led to essentially deregulating and desupervising, especially the biggest institutions. And so when we talk about modern monetary theory, are we talking about uh – the 1950s, or are we talking about something uh, newer, uh, dreamed up since the 1950s? <laughs> well, um, so sometimes people say that, uh, you know, there's nothing new in modern money theory, MMT. And uh, to a, a good extent, that's true. What we did is we went back and sort of uh, rediscovered uh, what was largely commonly understood at the end of World War II. Uh, during the financing of the war, uh, we know from the internal documents in the United States and in uh, Britain, uh, the governments knew finance was not a problem. They understood that the problem was, how are you going to release enough resources to prosecute the war effort? In the U.S., it was 50% of all production went to the war effort. How can you release all the resources to do that and fully employ the population? We were beyond full employment of the population and pay wages and not have inflation because you're removing so much of the production, but everybody still has wages and income, but nothing to buy. So the problem would be one of inflation. And so they designed ways to release the resources so that we didn't get inflation. And World War II was the first big war that the U.S. had with very little inflation. So it worked. But anyway, when they came out of the war, um, just as an example, the chair of the um, New York Fed gave speeches around the country saying, uh, the war has taught the people and the government that taxes are not needed for revenue purposes. Taxes serve other purposes, but we don't need taxes in order to pay for government spending. So what I'm saying is this was common knowledge. On the left was Abba Lerner. On the right was Milton Friedman. They all understood this. When you look at the history of, of taxes in the United States, they've tended to be created for wars and then two thirds or three quarters of them taken away again after the wars. And I, I don't think you really had income tax in a, any significant way on ordinary working people until World War Two, where there was, you know, cartoons about the victory tax and so forth. Uh, and, and and then the darn things never went away after the war. Yeah. Well, because uh, in 1929, the federal government was 3% of the economy. World War II is 50%. Now, did we go back to 3%? No, we did not. Uh, the federal government had a much bigger role to play in the economy uh, after World War II. We went down to a 25% government. And um, so if the government is 25% of the economy, it's generating a lot of income. Uh, all the government activities are generating income. The Cold War was a big one. And then the Vietnam War was a big one. And then um, the war on poverty is relatively big too. So the government is still creating incomes. And um, we needed to, uh, again, to uh, remove some demand from the economy to make room uh, for the Cold War, for the space effort to get to the moon and so on. And now, um, you know, uh, we, FDR put in place Social Security. Social Security is a very big government program. And what it is doing is providing income uh, to retirees and their beneficiaries. And um, that gives them income to spend, but they're not contributing much to production because they're retired. That's the whole idea. <laughs> And so we need to give space for their spending. And that's what taxes do.
I, it, it's it's strange though that it generally, apart from Social Security and Medicare, it generally has to be wars. And I, I'm on the one hand, I've seen studies from University of Massachusetts Amherst that say you'd get better results, more jobs, better paying jobs, better results for the economy with anything other than war spending, education, infrastructure, even not taxing working people in the first place would be better. Uh, but on the other hand, you have Congress giving the Pentagon stuff it doesn't even want, planes that don't even fly, so to create them in little bits and pieces in numerous districts all over the country for jobs. And you say, but why couldn't you fund other jobs, green jobs? And they say, oh, no, no, you can't. It's, it's, it's war jobs or nothing. Why, why is that? Well, uh, okay. I mean, obviously it's political. <laughs> Um, and uh, the war industry, which was built up in World War II and then in the Cold War, um, you know, has its own uh, interests at heart. Um, and so they want to keep the funds flowing. These don't create lots of jobs. Uh, they do absorb a huge amount of spending. Um, the generally speaking, uh, these are sort of the high tech, the, the most advanced parts of our economy. So they are um, uh, heavily capitalized, heavily mechanized. And what workers there are te tended to be unionized. That is probably less true now and tended to be high paid. So you, you are spending a lot of money for very few jobs. And I absolutely agree with what you're saying. What we need to do is rethink this. Let's create jobs directly. Let's not throw billions of money at um, the def so-called defense sector uh, and hope that some jobs trickle down to lower income, people with less education, not unionized and so on. Let's create the jobs directly uh, to employ them. Uh, the, the bang for the buck will be many orders of magnitude greater, and they could be um, doing things that actually are extremely socially useful rather than building uh, bombs that even in the, you know, the best of cases that we don't use them uh, isn't really benefiting us. Right. And, and so what would what would you propose specifically and how does it compare with anything in the in the build back better bill and the infrastructure bill that we hear so much about or, or at least what used to be in those bills? Well, we were hoping I mean, uh, supporters of, of MMT, but I think also a lot of progressive people were hoping there would be direct job creation. Yes, Green New Deal kinds of jobs. Um, there are two kinds of jobs for Green New Deal. I mean, some of these will be uh, uh, highly uh, mechanized and highly skilled workers. Um, we, we need those kinds of jobs. And that's the typical thing people think of with infrastructure. Infrastructure is sexy. Nobody in their right mind opposes it. We all have to drive over bridges. Uh, and, and we see, you know, the state of the infrastructure in the United States, D plus at best, according to the engineers. We need trillions of dollars spent on that. Now, most of these jobs are going to go to uh, contractors. Uh, the, 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 the government doesn't really build bridges. They pay for bridges to be built. So it's going to create a lot of income for contractors and a lot of um, wages for high skilled, high paid workers. That leaves so many people behind, including obviously women. Um, so we need to also have uh, jobs for everybody else. Green New Deal kinds of jobs, but also, you know, we, we need a lot of jobs in the social services. And uh, these don't require a lot of capital investment. Um, and uh, they don't require strength or anything like that. Uh, so... You know, child care is an example, and that was in Biden's uh, proposal. Uh, these can create jobs for a much broader part of the population. We desperately need these. So we need much more of that, too. That is less uh, sexy and appealing, especially to conservatives uh, who generally don't support this kind of stuff. 
We are speaking with Randall Ray, professor of economics at Bard College. Uh, what do you make, Randall, of the, the conversation around these bills that uh, I've, have been maybe the top news story in the United States for many weeks uh, and widely understood as the biggest pieces of legislation since FDR, or if not forever, uh, and, and, and generally labeled with dollar amounts that quietly have been multiplied over 10 years uh, without telling anyone that. Uh, and the, the single biggest question asked, the one never asked about military spending, is how do you pay for it? Um, and not much in the way of, of, of answers, really. Yes, we we worried that um, the Democratic leadership, uh, including the president, were going to play right into the conservatives' hands by uh, first, um, yes, playing along with the rules Congress has put on itself, 10-year horizons. Uh, that makes the numbers look really big. Uh, so we hear a number of 3.5 trillion. Wow, that's a huge number. I don't even know how many zeros there are, there are on that number. It's very, very scary. And I think Congress did that on purpose uh, to make any social spending, because as you said, military spending is never a problem. Nobody worries about that. But to make social spending look extremely expensive and scary. And then they also impose on themselves the requirement that we pay for it. Now, uh, we, we, as you say, we never pay for defense spending. We never pay for tax cuts for the rich. And we actually got through five trillion of um, pandemic response without pay fors. So it's pretty obvious we can do it without pay fors uh, if we really want to. This is, um, you know, the pay for is a self imposed constraint. And so anyway, you total it up, you say it's 3.5 trillion. Okay, where are we going to find 3.5 trillion? And so you get proposals, well, let's tax the billionaires. Okay, fine, I, I love taxing billionaires too. Uh, but you tax billionaires to reduce their uh, wealth and their richness. You don't tax them to pay for social spending for two reasons, one, you're, you're tying something that we hope will be popular, uh, which is saving the planet uh, through Green New Deal, with something that is unpopular in America, which is tax increases. I mean, generally it's unpopular and it's extremely unpopular among wealthy people. But so tax now wealthy you're going- people is extremely popular among most other people. That's right. But who can spend the money to buy the politicians to prevent this from ever happening? It's the rich folks. Now, I, I'm, I'm optimistic they will get something, uh, but you've already put up a barrier. And then the second problem is that, um, you know, what we really need to think of is releasing resources because we don't want inflation. We're, we're going to be attacked by saying that 3.5 trillion has got to be inflationary, okay? And some parts of this could possibly be inflationary. So we need to think about where are the resources gonna come from, not where are the dollars gonna come from. We need to tackle this the same way FDR tackled World War II. Where do we find the resources to completely redo the electrical grid? Okay, how are we going to put up the solar panels all over the United States and the windmills and so on? So the, uh, the right amount of uh, reduction of resource use is not correlated with the amount of money you take away from billionaires because the, uh, what economists call the propensity to consume of billionaires is very small. I mean, if you've got... Um, a hundred billion dollars in any particular year, they they don't consume much of that. Mm -mm. So if you're only taxing 10 people, uh, you may raise a lot of money, but you're not releasing resources. It's not gonna be a good inflation fighter. So what, what we're trying to do is get people to rethink the purposes of these. If you wanna tax rich people, you have to tax them enough so they're not rich anymore. That should be the goal. Not that you're going to raise money to pay for childcare, but that you're going to make sure that you tax them enough they're not rich. Because 
they would still be extremely rich if you just raised enough to equal the amount you're going to spend on childcare. Right. Okay. So the goal should be different. Tax them so they're not rich. Elizabeth Warren in the campaign, I looked at her website. And so she was proposing a two or three percent tax on wealth. And, you know, she said, and don't worry, rich people, because it's not even going to hurt you. Right. I said, well, hold it. If it's not going to hurt them, you've done no right. good. The whole purpose of the tax has to be to take enough that it really, really hurts. Otherwise, they're still filthy rich. You've done nothing for inequality. I think Joe Biden's line to them was nothing will fundamentally change. Uh, yeah, that's then the why point. bother? Right. Uh, so there, there is a political problem here, of course. And how do you do this? But if you could do it, uh, do you do it with progressive income tax, with wealth tax, with tax on financial transactions, uh, with tax on carbon? What do you What do you do? Well, see, that's another one. So progressives love the high speed uh, turnover tax, so a tax on financial transactions. But the goal of that tax should be to eliminate high-speed trading, not to raise revenue, okay? In other words, it should raise zero revenue. You eliminate the bad behavior, it's like smoking. You know, when you start to think of the, the tobacco tax as being a way to raise revenue, you don't want people to stop smoking, yeah. okay? You, so you've mixed the goals. Uh, the transactions tax is the worst possible tax. Uh, as far as releasing resources. It's not gonna release resources. It's not gonna help fight inflation. And you don't want revenue anyway. So it's just all confused. So but you do if want you don't the want tax, you it, just want it more severely than it than is being proposed. Well, I mean, I think what you want is to eliminate high-speed trading. I think what you want is to eliminate the production of carbon that's destroying Earth. You don't want to raise revenue, and a tax might not be the right way. A, a legal okay. ban I, on those I, activities in, in, instead. Yes. I'm very skeptical of using a market solution to solve a problem that is created by markets. Yeah, yeah. And and, and what about this topic of, of full employment? You mentioned being beyond full employment in, in World War II. Uh, what does that mean? And is that a good or a bad thing? And how do we get to full employment? Well, I, what I mean by um, in World War II, of course, we sent a lot of people off to fight. And uh, we needed um, to ramp up the, um, the war industries. So we had people... Um, working, uh, their patriotic duty was to, um, you know, work and build ships. And uh, of course that was desirable, but you could not continue to operate beyond full capacity, having people work extra hours, uh, overtime work, weekend work, um, and uh, continue that forever. So that's what I meant by we were beyond full employment now, did we did we wind down in the um, in uh, the most desirable way? No, uh, we had a campaign to convince women that they they needed to go back home and get out of the labor force and make room for the men who were coming back. Okay, that wasn't right. Uh, but anyway, um, the uh, operating the economy at that high level of employment. Uh, would have been uh, inflationary eventually. So trying to maintain aggregate demand by general government spending, especially on high-tech stuff, is going to tend to be inflationary. And what we recommend instead, that's sort of a hiring off the top strategy, okay? Uh, what we recommend is a hiring off the bottom strategy target directly the people who are unemployed and the people whose wages are very low or who are forced to, you know, put together three or four part-time jobs, give all of them full-time work at good pay and good benefits. Uh, we call this the job guarantee. And uh, it's not just MMT that um, pushes this. Uh, there are lots of progressives and even some conservatives who are pushing the idea that it makes no sense to leave people who want to work unemployed. Let's find good jobs for them to do 
that are in the public interest and let's pay them decent wages and benefits and use welfare and unemployment compensation, food stamps as a backup uh -huh. for people who don't want to work, should not work, will not work. Uh, but anyone who wants to work, it makes no sense to say, oh, here's a handout instead. Um, give them a job. Is this an argument you're making against the idea of a basic income guarantee? I think that if someone says, you know, I really want to work and contribute to society and you say, well, sorry, here's here's a check, though. That makes no sense. Well, but what about, OK, OK, here's a job and here's a check, too. Or, I mean, well, are they, are they job, in opposition or do they conflict with each other, the, the ideas? I think that anyone who is working should get a pay and benefit package sufficient that they do not need a handout. Okay, now, what about the people who cannot, should not, will not work? Of course we should support them. But what I'm saying is, let's give jobs to everyone who wants to work, and then those who shouldn't, won't, uh, then let's provide them with decent income. Yeah. Um, Randall Ray, we've got about two minutes left. Um, I, one of okay. the things I notice when they inevitably predictably scale back these proposals and hack and cut away at them is they go from being simple universal proposals to means tested and generating a whole bureaucracy and eliminating large chunks of the population as supporters of those policies. Do, do you think there's an advantage in making some of these job creation and social benefits in these bills simpler and more universal uh, in the way Social Security is, uh, as opposed to all the, the endless means testing and defining and surveying and studying the, you know, the, the, the worthy poor? Well, in, in general, yes, universal programs um, are um, more sustainable. Uh, means testing, look, especially if you're means testing and you're not providing jobs. So Clinton comes in and he says, we're going to end welfare as we know it, okay, because welfare is unpopular. What we want to do is convince the American people that uh, these people are deserving poor uh, because uh, we're going to get them off welfare and we're going to have work requirements. Okay, fine. But then we don't provide the jobs. <laughs> it cannot work yeah. if you don't provide the jobs. So if he had first said, we're going to provide a job to anybody who wants to work, decent pay, decent benefits, and then um, we're going to... Um, right you know, re reform welfare, uh, fine. Then it, it would have been an improvement, but it was not an improvement. It was a step backwards. It, it was a lesson that ought to have long since been learned, but maybe hasn't by enough people. We've been speaking with Randall Ray, who's a professor of economics at Bard College. Randall, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.